Well, that was some result just in time for Mother's Day, wasn't it? I have to be honest, while I was obviously hoping for a double no vote to win the day, I figured if it were to happen, it would be tight margins. It was just that gut feeling of caution due to the sheer size and reach of the Yes campaign. Yet here we are, an absolutely resounding rejection of the nonsense served up by our government and backed up by the NGOs and the majority of the so-called opposition parties. Incredible margins, truth be told. 67.7% in the family referendum with only one constituency voting yes, and even then by the thinnest of thin margins, and a whopping 73.9% in the care referendum, the highest ever no vote by percentage. And while those results are fantastic news and what should be a very strong message to both government and opposition, that's not what I want to focus on today because in my view, the yes campaign was a microcosm of all that is wrong in Ireland. Irish politics at present, so I want to focus on that. I want to focus on the behaviour of our government and our opposition in the run-up to voting day and in the aftermath of the results. I want to talk about the devious and underhanded behaviour that was deployed in the campaign. I want to talk about the absolute lack of any decorum. I want to talk about the attempted destruction and perversion of democracy. Buckle up, this is going to be a long one. Now there's some pretty big charges I'm levelling, aren't they? Well, if you've been watching the campaign unfold, you'll understand why. We've had politicians blatantly lie about what the constitution says. We've had bribes to gain votes. We've had begging, pleading and gaslighting guilt trips, all in an effort to sway the votes. We've had NGOs threaten to fall in line or else. We've had incredibly weak opposition parties falling in line despite their supposed reservations and who went practically silent on polling day. We've had all the lies and misrepresentations left unchallenged by the established news media. We've had relevant information held back. We've had ministers hiding from debates. We've had backpedalling and backtracking at a rate of knots from several TDs and opposition parties. And we've even had our own Taoiseach seemingly breaking electoral law, even though he denies it. I mean, why wouldn't he deny it? It's worked for him in the past, given that he is still somehow Taoiseach. This campaign has been nothing short of a slap in the face of true democracy. So let's dissect just how bad it was and what it means for our democracy going forward. So it all started with Roderick O'Gorman telling NGOs that they better vote the right way, the progressive way, or else they'd have to explain themselves. And note the language here, the progressive way, indicating that a contrary opinion is regressive. What a way to insult an entire cohort of voters. But the threat was clear to everyone. Everyone, NGOs better fall in line and push what the government want. And given that the government controls the funding for a wide array of NGOs to the tune of about 6 billion euro a year, well, the threat couldn't be any clearer, could it? In fact, that threat ended up being possibly the clearest thing about the government's entire Yes campaign. How on earth this wasn't openly challenged by the media, I'll never understand. I mean, let's be real here, it's tantamount to buying support for the Yes campaign campaign, isn't it? True democracy and debate be damned. And so, they fell in line with government and out of step with the people they're supposed to represent. But it doesn't stop there. While he made that threat, he told that lie, didn't he? That constant and persistent lie that popped up time and time again in various forms, from various TDs and NGOs, unchallenged by the established news media. You know the one I mean. That lie that the constitution says a woman's place or duties are in the home. And once again, I find myself having to say that the constitution does not reference a woman's place or duties in the home. It references a woman's life in the home and a mother's duties in the home. And yes, mothers have duties in the home and no, it is not sexist to say so. I have repeated that same explanation online until I was blue in the face over the course of the campaign. It popped up so often despite electoral commission chair Marie Baker making it very clear on multiple occasions that the constitution does not confine women to the home. And yet, the lie persisted. I covered in a previous video how Catherine Martin told the same lie, was called out on Twitter for it to the point that a community note was attached, and even after Marie Baker again made it clear that what she said was a misrepresentation of the constitution, she doubled down when asked about it. Absolutely disgraceful behaviour. Telling lies and doubling down even when 
been corrected. And the issue here is born of that famous saying, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got its boots on. For a lot of people, the lie is all that's heard. They don't hear the rebuttal or the truth, and so the lie takes hold. This can be seen, by the way, in the aftermath of the vote, whereby international news outlets are also referencing a woman's place in the home, despite our constitution not saying those words. And she's not the only one who left the lies up on social media for all to see, even after being called out. Other TDs did similar, the Green Party in particular were quite bad for it, and the NGOs followed suit, with the National Women's Council of Ireland being one of the biggest offenders. Where was the accountability for public bodies, NGOs and politicians who were spreading these lies, this misinformation? Nowhere is the answer, and that is very problematic. When there is no accountability, there are no consequences, so those in and with power who are so inclined will continue to spout lies without fear of reproach, and in doing so will try to sway and impact the vote. As I said, this campaign was a microcosm of politics in this country, and this is one of the clearest examples. We see this all throughout politics and state bodies here in Ireland. Zero accountability for lies. Well, let's be real here, zero accountability for anything. And it begs the question of just what will be classed as misinformation when the new disinformation watchdog gets going. But on we go. The lies didn't stop there. This time, they took the form of bribery and begging. Vote yes so that we can offer better supports to carers and people with disabilities. That was the begging, blackmailing cry from multiple government sources in order to strengthen the yes vote. Carers and those who care about the plight of carers up and down the country could see this nonsense for what it was. Firstly, there is nothing at all, not a damn thing, stopping the state from stepping up and supporting those carers and people with disabilities right now. And secondly, if you followed carer and senator Dr Tom Clonan at all during the campaign, you will have heard him explain perfectly the issues with the proposed wording from the point of view of carers, namely that the wording places care within the family only with no mention of care outside the family, and with the word strive chosen carefully as an opt-out for the state from providing care and support for those who need it. And if you look at the proposed wording, it said that the state shall strive to support that care. What care, you may ask? Care within the family, as that is the only type of care referenced. Incidentally, this view has been vindicated after the release of documents after the vote to grip media under a Freedom of Information request, which shows that the government ministers chose the wording carefully to, quote, avoid a concrete obligation on the state to support carers. But Sir Varadkar even said the quiet part loud when he was a guest on the six o'clock show on Virgin Media in the run-up to voting day, when he said, while talking about care, that he doesn't think it is the responsibility of the state. Now, of of course he claims he was misrepresented and that it was classic social media, but we all saw the clip and the full clip was just as easy to find, so no, it was more a case of classic Leo Varadkar than anything else. But we'll come back to good old Leo in a bit. Now obviously this was all defeated with the vote, so there's no point in me rehashing the arguments, but it's the way in which the yes side argued their case that I'm highlighting here. Bribery and guilt tripping with no respect at all given to truth, integrity or the electorate. Using carers and people with disabilities as a political football by telling people that a yes vote will get them more resources when they know they could give them better resources and supports right now. It's just sick, isn't it? I mean, how low can you go? Simon Harris let the cat out of the bag when speaking to Grip Media's Ben Scallon when he said that it was entirely true that more funding could be given in the next budget with or without a yes vote. The level of disrespect to both the people of this country and our intelligence knows no bounds. The guilt-tripping gaslighting continued with claims that there are children out there who are less than in the eyes of the Constitution, despite the Constitution clearly saying that all children are equal, regardless of their parental situation. Again, playing with language to achieve their own ends. If they wanted the family referendum to go through, they could have simply added a provision for single-parent families families, or as I suggested, take out the on which the family is founded bit when referring to marriage, so that only the word family 
needs to be defined and there are plenty of acceptable definitions available without much stress or hassle to find. But no, they wanted to cover up their vague and shoddy wording by playing on people's emotions when it comes to children. Gaslighting, emotional blackmail, an insult to true democracy in my opinion. Speaking of true democracy, a true democracy needs a strong opposition, right? Well, that was sorely lacking in this campaign too. Labour went all in from the get-go to get rid of that pesky sexist language, followed by an ever so slightly more reserved Social Democrats who bemoaned the wording, but rode in behind the government's Yes Yes campaign anyway. People before profit also joined the Yes Yes campaign despite disagreeing with the wording, while saying it would be misogynistic to vote no because, I guess being a mother and protecting mothers is sexist? But what about the biggest opposition party and the biggest threat to the status quo? What about Sinn Féin? Well, they took a while to make a decision, which is something they seem to have turned into a habit lately, and eventually decided to attack the wording, saying government failed to use the carefully considered wording of the Citizens' Assembly, that they rushed the process, and that the wording lacks ambition and the ability to deliver the real and meaningful change carers need. So, I mean, obviously they saw the light and figured this would be a slam dunk to oppose the government, right? To show that they are the only party with their finger on the pulse of the electorate to actually offer the people a contrary voice in the din of yes parties. Yeah, no. No, after all that strongly worded waffle, they just said, f*** our reservations and f*** your votes, we'll go for the yes yes anyway. And then in the aftermath of the votes, all of them decided that their hearts hadn't really been in it and that it was all government's fault. You know, even though they all campaigned for a yes yes. Not a brain cell between them it seems. How hard would it have been for an opposition TD or leader to simply hold their hands up, admit they got it wrong, apologise to the people they are meant to represent and promise to get more in touch with an electorate that they clearly have diverged from. Yes, it would have been damage limitation, but if they had actually meant it, politics and democracy would be in a slightly better place. But here we are. I cannot express how utterly disgusted I am at the opposition's stances on these referendums. Aside from a number of independent TDs such as the extremely well-spoken Catherine Connolly and Aintu's Patter Tobin, the opposition may as well have been sitting on government benches. Not a single ounce of critical thinking between them. Every single one of them admitting the wording was poor and just rowing in behind government anyway. They can all hear the public backlash towards government over pretty much every single issue at present, so they had to know there would at least be an element of a protest vote, and yet they all just abandoned their voters to try and hop on the feel-good express just in time for the upcoming local and European elections. Absolutely pathetic. And make no mistake, this whole campaign was an effort to rekindle the feel-good vibes felt after we voted for same-sex marriage and repealing the 8th. You know, votes that did have real impacts and did actually afford new rights to people. This vote was to try to recapture that feel-good vibe in a vain attempt to give the government a rare win when everything else they touch turns to absolute shite and elicits nothing but disgust and anger from an electorate that is quickly losing what little patience they had to start with. And how could we talk about disgust and anger towards government without mentioning on Taoiseach Leo Varadkar? He had quite the eventful campaign, didn't he? The campaign reiterated everything we all know about El Leo. He's above the law and above reproach. Starting with his dismissive walk-off from a press conference when Ben Scallon tried to ask him and the other two leaders about Catherine Martin's lies, then his quiet part loud escapade on the six o'clock show, and ending with him breaking electoral law as far as I can see. Such arrogance and elitism, it just beggars belief. And yet the evidence is there for all to see. Now I've covered the first two points both here and in a previous video, so let's focus on the last one, shall we? The biggest affront to democracy. On polling day, Leo Varadkar released a video on social media urging a yes, yes vote. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, except he did it right outside the polling station, which is not allowed under electoral law. Of course, his team denied it by claiming that no breach of the Electoral Act took place, the Taoiseach did not obstruct interference, 
interfere or induce any electors in the vicinity of the polling station. Ah, so all fine and dandy then. Well, except for the small matter that the Electoral Act goes further than just that. Now I'm no legal eagle, I'm just a millennial mammy with a YouTube channel, but when I read the Electoral Act, it seems to me that Leo Varadkar did in fact break several of the rules. He was less than 100 metres away, as seen by the footage shared on TikTok and Twitter. He was promoting the interest of a political party, he attempted to induce electors to vote in a particular way, and he used a public address mechanism, namely social media, to broadcast relating to a vote. Now the last point may be excluded, as social media may or may not be covered, but what's the get out of jail free excuse for the rest? Just the assertion that he did no wrong apparently. Imagine it was so easy to get away with nonsense like that in the real world. Next up it's the media. Now Gavin Riley wrote in the Sunday Independent that broadcasters and journalists are hamstrung by the electoral rules. They have to show that they are remaining unbiased which leads to a 50-50 time split for each side and leads to less questions lest they be accused of being biased. And while I can understand and appreciate the balancing act that this entails, I have to make a counterpoint. Lies and misinformation are biased. Facts are not. Calling out lies and misinformation is still the number one priority for any journalist worth their salt. And this should have happened more throughout this and any referendum or vote. Perhaps the Electoral Commission's rules do need to be loosened somewhat so that journalists can be more assured about it. But then would that have changed anything when every media outlet aside from the ditch and gripped seemed to be content to just relay the government message of the day? Then we come back to the man who started it all with his threat to the NGOs, Roderick O'Gorman. He managed escaping the entire campaign without ever stepping up to debate the issues for the benefit of the public. No, he just ran scared and stuck to one-on-one -on -one interviews. But he gave us enough to know he is not to be trusted and really, in my view, should resign after this embarrassing defeat. But of course he won't because, well, that word doesn't seem to exist for our government at present and neither does shame or the concept of doing the right and decent thing. So what did O'Gorman do? Well, he withheld the minutes of meetings on the constitutional changes before voting day for a start, hiding the possible ramifications. Well, we'll never truly know as he hid behind the McKenna principles on that one. He also refused to publish the advice given by the Attorney General despite similar advice being released in previous referenda. That advice was mercifully leaked by who else but the f***ing ditch, just in time for voters to have a look before casting their votes. So what are the issues here? Well firstly he told Jennifer Whitmore of the Social Democrats that it was his understanding that they were not able to provide the advice from the Attorney General despite giving no reason for this answer. The leaked document itself gives no indication that it was meant to be kept away from the public's eye as far as I can see. But worse than that, he claimed in an interview with the Irish Independent that former Attorney General and current Senator Michael McDowell was wrong in his assertions that there will be implications for laws surrounding tax, social welfare, family, succession, planning and immigration law. He said, The very clear legal advice we've received throughout from the Attorney General is that these items will not be impacted by what we're proposing to amend in the Constitution. This is an outright lie. Simple as that, the leaked documents prove as much where the Attorney General draws attention to multiple areas where laws will be impacted and need to change. The electorate were crying out for clarity on the term durable relationships and he lied through his teeth on its ramifications. It's really that simple. He lied and withheld important information from the electorate. An absolute disgrace and another slap in the face to true democracy and the electorate. And since I've mentioned the McKenna principles, that is that no state money should be used to fund one side of a referendum campaign, have they been breached? When the vast majority, somewhere in the region of 90% of the National Women's Council of Ireland's funding comes directly from the government, when do the McKenna principles kick in? The NWCI had quite a visible campaign with flyers, leaflets and even a mobile billboard, whereas those organisations like the Countess, who rely solely on donations from the public, and the silence protest had a far more muted campaign by comparison, but one that was thankfully just as enthusiastic 
and managed to do more with less. Social media played no small part in levelling the playing field here, but the question remains, when do NGOs fall foul of the McKenna principles given where their funding comes from? The aftermath of the results have also revealed a rotten, bitter and cowardly face to the losing side. I've already covered the cowardly opposition, so we'll focus on the rest. Firstly, not a single yes side TD was at Dublin Castle when the results were read out. They all scurried off to pack their bags for their Paddy's Week junkets, with their tails between their legs, all I'm sure, hoping that by the time they get home, things will have blown over. Sickening disrespect to the democratic process and all those who voted and campaigned for no. Then we had multiple government TDs come out and say, only brave enough after the results were in, mind you, that they actually voted no, no. In what can only be described as a shameless scramble for self-preservation. Some of these TDs actually canvassed and therefore campaigned for a yes, yes. And before anyone asks, yes, I understand the party whip system just fine. But it's the campaigning for one thing while secretly planning on voting the other way that disgusts me. If, that is, they actually did vote no and are just saying it, which, let's be real here, either could be true and both are just as pathetic and disgusting as the other. And let's not forget Regina Doherty, who was far more concerned with who leaked the Attorney General's advice, rather than, you know, listening to the electorate. You couldn't make it up. The media have been no better. Struggling to find an excuse for the many politicians with egg on their face, the media have been scrambling to come up with answers, and each are as insulting as the last. First up, the electorate didn't know what they were voting for. The government didn't do a good enough job of explaining themselves to us tickos, and bless us, we just didn't know what we were voting for, apparently. Or was it the dreaded far right and their mammies? Or maybe it was a massive protest vote for no other reason than to give the finger to the government and cut our noses off to spite our faces in the process. No thought at all given to the actual reasons. In fact, when they have been given, they've even been dismissed out of hand. Kira Doherty, I'm looking at you here. But just so the politicians and media are clear, the reasons most voted no is as follows. No one could predict what the purposely vague durable relationships could mean or how it included the parent-child relationship and therefore single parent families. Clarity was purposely hidden from the electorate. The vast majority of people, it seems, actually like and respect their mothers and want to keep the protections and recognition of motherhood in the constitution. And lastly, the vast majority of people could see the new 42B as the slap in the face to carers and people with disabilities that it was. It's really that simple. But will they listen? I won't hold my breath. As you can see, it has been a campaign full of disrespect and patronising bullshit. It has been a campaign of dishonesty and cowardice. It has been a campaign that has shown up the arrogance of the government. It has highlighted just how far from the people any of the big parties are, and just how out of touch with reality they are. A slap in the face to democracy and the electorate. That's all this wasteful campaign was. The only bright side is that the electorate stood up and showed them who's boss and hopefully smacked some sense into some of them in the process. But again, I won't hold my breath because that would require politicians actually listening. So what did you think of the campaign? Am I going overboard in my critiques? Did the government play fair? Or were they so obsessed with getting that rare win that they threw decency out the window and be damned with proper order and decorum? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified of new content. If you want to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee or a super thanks, which is greatly appreciated, and a huge thank you to those of you that already have. You can also follow me on Twitter. Until next time, slong a full.